So again, welcome to um, our second session of the Truth About Nutrition series, which is all on fiber. Before we really kick off, just know that if you need or want captions, we do have that option there for you. You should be able to find that closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, and you would just potentially need to hover over that part of the screen and then um, just select the closed captioning if you if you need it. With that, we'll do some really quick introductions. So my name is Nikki Johnson. I'm an extension educator with the University of Minnesota Extension, as well as North Dakota State University Extension, um, really focusing in on community Everyone health and nutrition. And joining me today, um, I have a fellow registered dietitian, Mary Schrader. Mary, just doing a quick little wave. You want to say hi, Mary? Oh, sure. Hi. Um, my name is Mary Schrader, and I am also an extension educator with the University of Minnesota, and I am joining you from near Wilmer, Minnesota today. Thanks, Mary. So let's just do a quick touch on what we're going to be going over this afternoon in this 45 minutes we have together. Um, again, we are talking all about fiber. So really what we want to do is talk about the benefits of fiber as a part of a really healthy eating pattern. We're going to talk about different food sources that are going to be really rich in fiber. And then also talk a bit about ways that you can incorporate more fiber into your eating plan. So if you haven't been able to tell yet, um, you should know that I'm super excited to offer this session today. I was kind of sharing this with Mary earlier, um, but fiber is actually one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to nutrition. And I don't know why. Um, and maybe your excitement of about fiber isn't exactly um, attuned to me. <laughs> um, it's That's probably not unlikely um, because the average American <clears throat> In fact, um, less than 10% of Americans com consume enough daily fiber. Fiber is probably not something that's on your mind. It's probably not something you get all, all that excited about, um, but it is something we're gonna learn more about today. And like I said, I'm just super pumped that um, I get to share this with you. So we're gonna kick it off with a nice question here. What comes to mind when you hear the word fiber? Go ahead and throw that into the chat. Where is everybody's head at when you when you hear the word fiber? And yes, I realize that we're probably going to get a variety of responses in the chat on this one. Okay, regularity, veggies, bulk, grit, fullness, a broom. Okay, veggies, fruits and veggies, greens, healthy, beans, <laughs> supplements, being regular. Okay, I'm not surprised on these responses, not at all. But I do appreciate the sharing there. So fact or myth, folks, fiber can be found in a variety of foods. What do you say? Fact or myth, fiber can be found in a variety of foods. All right, we've got a room full of smart cookies here, Mary. That is, in fact, a fact. Um, fiber is really found in our carbohydrate-rich foods. Um, and this food group or food family has a lot of members. It's going to include grains, veggies, fruit, beans, and legumes. Um, so fiber is really found in a variety of different foods that we eat. So what exactly is fiber? Uh, dietary fiber is sometimes also known as bulk. I saw that in the chat. Or even roughage. And it includes the part of our plant foods that our body can't actually digest or absorb. Unlike, you know, those other food components as such things as like our macronutrients, you know, which are, we talked about last week, um, what our body breaks down for, for energy. But fiber isn't digested by the body. Instead, what happens, it's going to pass um, pretty much intact throughout our di digestive tract. When we think about fiber or talk about fiber, we usually talk about two different types, and that's soluble and insoluble. So soluble fiber is fiber that, um, ah, let me start that over again. <laughs> um, soluble fiber is fibers that dissolve in water. And um, 
these are things that come from foods such as the barley, the oats, the oat bran, rye, um, fruits, and legumes. And these are what we think of as kind of our slower to digest fibers. Um, they become viscous in our system, and they're also more fermentable, um, which means they help with the pre and probiotics in your GI system. And Nikki's going to go a little bit more in depth into some the reasons why these are important a little bit later. So next we have our insoluble fibers, and these are fibers that don't dissolve in water. So they're kind of our quick fibers, the things that get that bulk and kind of get things through our system quite quickly because they're the non-viscous viscous ones. And these are also less fermentable, but they still have lots of valuable things that they do. So again, it's important to remember that we eat a variety of different foods to get both the soluble and the insoluble types of fiber. Okay, I seem to be there. I have a little bit of a delay when I click the button today, so um, it might take a moment for my slides to switch. So um, Nikki mentioned that we do not get enough fiber in the United States, and um, we're actually pretty far from what the recommendations are. Um, we get about 16 grams on average. And what they recommend from the dietary reference intakes is about 14 grams per 1,000 calories. So for women, this works out to be about 21 to 25 grams per day. And for men, about 30 to 38. Um, fiber is also important for children. Um, to give you an idea, um, children between the ages of two to eight need about 14 to 20 grams a day. And um, youth between nine and 18 need about 17 to 30. Um, a recent study just came out a couple weeks ago where it talked about fruit and vegetable intake for young children, um, kind of that preschool age. And what they found was that many children don't even get half the amount of vegetables and fruits that they need a day. And if we think of one of the challenges with especially the younger preschoolers is constipation. So if we can really up that fiber by getting them to eat more fruits and vegetables, um, that can help with that constipation problem. So I just wanted to throw that in there with our recommendations right away because it's important for all ages. Um, so fiber in our foods comes from many different places. When we look at my plate, um, we primarily get fiber from our grains, fruits, vegetables, and our beans and legumes. And those are found in the protein group. So again, a nice variety of different things from my plate where we can get fiber. So the importance of really trying to get a lot of variety in our diets. So we're going to start focusing a little bit on the fiber in the grain group. Um, these come in a variety of different ways. We can have what we call our whole grains and also our refined grains. And um, we're gonna talk primarily about our whole grains. Um, to give you an idea, one slice of whole grain wheat bread is about one to two grams. An ounce of ready to eat cereal that is a whole grain, especially your bran cereals that have a lot of that bran in it are 10 grams or more, and then half a cup of cooked barley, um, bulgur, grits, and oatmeal. Um, so, it's important to know the difference between a whole grain and a refined grain. Um, so the whole grain is where we find the fiber. So this is kind of a cutout of what a kernel of grain looks like. So on the outside, we have the bran, and that's an excellent source of fiber, the B vitamins, and also minerals. On um, the inside, we have the endosperm, which is kind of that starchy piece. It has some protein and also has some vitamins. And then the tiny little piece in the middle is the germ, and that contains your B vitamins, your vitamin E, and also your healthy fats. Okay. Um, so when we process foods, a lot, a lot of times they take that bran off of the kernel for a couple different reasons. It'll cook quicker if it doesn't have the bran on it. And also people really like the look of things that are kind of more that that nice pristine white. So if you have a thing of white flour, white bread, some people really like that look of white. So that was why they kind of initially started taking that bran off. So it had that nice clean look to it. Um, but now we know that that bran really is very important in the whole grains. Um, so it's good to try and choose foods that are whole grains. Um, there are some foods that are just naturally whole grains. Um, think, if you think of like popcorn, I like to use that as a good example because you actually put the, the kernel in the popcorn popper and it comes out and you have all parts of it. There's not like a pieces that are left. So you can get that bran right in it. Um, our oats is another good example of something that you typically don't see where they take the bran off. Um, however, things such as your wheat is oftentimes where we do see where the bran has been taken off. And that's why it is white if you take the white flour is because they take the bran off and then all that's left on the inside is that germ part. And that's what we see as the white flour. Um, so it's important that we keep that bran on there so that we get more of the fiber. Okay. 
Um, so how do you tell if a food is a whole grain or not? There's a couple different ways. Um, one way is to look at the nutrition facts label. Um, this isn't going to tell you exactly if it's a whole grain or not, but it's at least going to tell you if it has a good source of fiber on it. Um, you can look at the label and if it says, um, you know, it has certain grams of fiber, you can compare it to other foods. So especially in the cereal aisle, that's really nice because you can look at one cereal and go, oh, this has zero grams of fiber and another one has maybe be two grams of fiber. That's going to be a good clue that, hey, this pro very likely could be a whole grain. So the next thing you're going to want to do is look at the ingredient list. And this is really where you find um, the key to whole grains. Um, you want to look for items on the ingredient label where whole grain is the first ingredient. So things such as whole corn, whole wheat, um, those are things that are going to be a clue that it is a whole grain food. Um, there are instances like you might have a bread that's maybe half whole wheat and half white flour. So then it might say, you know, whole wheat flour and then enriched flour, but you still know that there's more of the whole wheat flour than the enriched. Okay. That gets a little confusing sometimes. Um, and there you kind of talk about, you know, it's that whole overall daily intake. It's good to get your whole grains, but maybe some people don't like the coarseness or the texture of a whole grain. They might say, I'm going to go for one that's maybe a little bit more half and half. And then I really like brand cereal in the morning. So again, really looking at that whole daily intake and not just focusing on one or two foods. Okay. Um, there are some foods again that are just naturally whole grains like your oats. Um, typically, if you're going to have like, uh, if you buy a container of quick cooking oats, you're not going to see it's not going to say whole oats, it just says oats on it. So you just kind of have to know that, hey, oats are naturally a whole grain food. They haven't been processed to take that bran off. Same with brown rice. Um, if it says brown rice, then you know that it is a whole grain, whereas white rice, that bran again has been removed. Okay. Um, another thing that kind of helps is if you look for something called the whole grain stamp. Um, this is something that you'll see on foods. And um, it's important to remember with this, however, that manufacturers have to pay to put this stamp on their their packages. Um, so a lot of your larger manufacturers will pay that extra fee so that you know for sure it's 100% grain, whole grain. Whereas maybe some of your smaller manufacturers will say, you know, that's, I'd rather just promote it in other ways and really just let people know it's a whole grain versus paying for that stamp. So it is something you'll see on some products and not others. So it's a good cue if you see it on there, but if you don't see it on there, it doesn't mean that it's not a whole grain. It just means you have to search a little bit more on that ingredient label. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I was just going to mention, and I'm, I'm going to go back just a slide here for just a second. So Mary kind of said, already alluded to um, the nutrition facts label. Um, one thing that you can look for if you're checking out that nutrition facts label to see whether or not a food is a good source of fiber. If it has two and a half grams of fiber per serving, it's considered a good source. If it's five grams per serving or more, it's considered an excellent source. So if you're checking for that fiber on a nutrition facts label, those are like two magical numbers. Anything more than that, I see somebody added in the chat that fiber one cereal, whew, lots of fiber um, <laughs> in a single serving there. So check out the nutrition facts label for, for those pieces. Now, fiber isn't just in our whole grains. We're also going to find a great amount of fiber in our vegetables. So most vegetables contain about two to three grams of fiber per serving. So I always like to give an idea, what does that even look like? You know, how do I know what a serving is? That gets tricky sometimes. Um, but that's going to look like a half a cup of raw or cooked veggies um, or one cup of, say, like raw bean sprouts or even leafy greens. So if you're thinking about ways you, that you would want to increase your fiber intake as far as the vegetable group, that's, you know, adding adding um, raw vegetables to your snacks or meals um, and eating vegetables like potatoes and zucchini with their skin on. So having the skin on is going to be um, an added bonus. It's going to have more of that fiber. When we think about our fruit group, um, again, a really great place to be finding our fiber. And you're going to find uh, fiber in your fruit, whether it's fresh, fro frozen, or even dried. And typically, you're going to see about two grams of fiber per serving. Again, I like to give a good idea of what that even looks like. So how do I get, you know, a serving of fruit? So that's going to look like a medium apple, banana, kiwi, smaller fruit like that, or a, a half a cup of, say, like applesauce or berries. 
one thing we did want to point out is that um, sometimes when people are thinking about fruit, their mind naturally goes to fruit juice. However, uh, fruit juices contain very little fiber. Um, and again, that's often because pulp, uh, the pulp or seeds are going to be removed as well as the skin. So we're going to get a, a lot less fiber in our fruit if we're just getting it from juice. So if you can think whole fruit over processed fruit. In the magical fruit, I know some people call it the musical, but I think it is the magical. Um, that's thinking about those fiber or that fiber in our legumes. So legumes, beans are a phenomenal way to get fiber. Um, it, because in a serving, you're going to see about six to eight grams of fiber. So think about that. It's double of what your fruits and veggies are. Um, and even even our grains, right? We're get, this is a phenomenal place to get your fiber. Um, again, many of them provide about six to eight. Some categories of legumes are only going to provide about five grams of fiber per serving. But if you remember back to that nutrition facts label, that's still going to be an excellent source. So um, our beans that have that six to eight grams, that's going to look like black beans, black eyed peas, kidney beans, navy beans, pinto beans. The five gram per serving legumes, um, that's going to be like garbanzo beans, great northern beans lentils, lima beans, and split peas. Um, I know last week we talked about some favorite ways that people like to liked to add in beans and lentils into their meals. Uh, and a lot of people mentioned soup, salads, adding them to casseroles, special bean dishes or lentil dishes. Um, and that's a phenomenal way to kind of sneak in that, that extra fiber. So I'm curious, thinking about um, these different fiber rich foods. What are some of your favorites? So you think about that list, the whole grains, fruits, veggies, legumes, which, which one, which ones are your favorite? Beans are good with eggs too. I've never tried that Jordan. Okay. Whole grain bread, raspberries. Yeah. Raspberries have a great amount of fiber. Banana, beans, berries with oats. I like that we're mixing up. We're adding two different sources of fiber together. Right. Farro, berries, veggies. Okay, love it. Again, we have to stop asking about food things, I think, Mary, during our 12 o'clock calls um, because it always spurs a little bit of hunger. <laughs> okay, so we've got all of these wonderful fiber rich foods. Mary touched on, you know, the soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. We've talked about the different types of foods. Now we want to talk about um, what kind of health benefits we're going to see from our fiber-rich foods. Um, because you might be asking yourself, you know, like, why, why do we have this whole webinar on fiber anyways? Well, it's because there are a lot of fantastic health benefits that come along with eating a variety of these high-fiber foods. The first one I want to talk about is gut health. And I think some of you kind of maybe mentioned this in, in the chat earlier on, but, um, you know, fiber is good for our gut health. And when I think about the role of fiber on our intestinal tract, I like to um, liken this to being kind of like a toothbrush for your insides. And when I say that, you know, every day you're going to grab your toothbrush, right? And we're brushing our teeth to help brush away all of the extra bacteria, the sugar, and the not so great things for our teeth, right? Fiber kind of acts like that for our digestive tract um, in our intestines. It helps to move waste along with enough water, of course, um, and kind of sort of sweep it out of our system. So I always like to think of fiber as the toothbrush for your insides. Um, <laughs> and so when we're talking about gut health here, when we do eat enough fiber, it does help to normalize that bowel function, that bowel movement. It helps to prevent constipation. Um, and that actually can help to reduce the risk for a few different things. So it can reduce the pressure in our lower, lower bowels. Um, it can prevent things like, again, constipation, hemorrhoids, and even diverticula, which we'll touch on a little bit. Um, in addition to that, though, the fiber can actually help to um, dilute and bind and help to move through any cancer-causing agents from our colon. So eating enough fiber, eating the recommended amount of fiber every single day um, does lower your risk of colon cancer. 
but the health benefits do not end there. Um, a, a diet high in fiber and starches can also help to protect against heart disease and strokes by lowering blood pressure and improving um, our lipids or our cholesterol levels and reducing inflammation. So you might be wondering how on earth, how on earth is it doing all of this for our heart, right? Well, here is how um, eating fiber can actually help to lower your cholesterol, which we know, of course, is good for our heart, heart health. In our stomachs, there is something called bile. And bile helps with the digestive process. And it's partly made up from cholesterol. Um, in the stomach, then it's going to, that cholesterol is going to bind with food and acids in that dig digestion. So when we eat fiber and food, food is moving through us faster at a more rapid pace, um, they have to call, the body has to call on more bile to be made, which has to take that cholesterol out of the blood to be used. So it actually helps to lower the cholesterol. I always just think that's fascinating. How awesome. Um, when we get enough fiber, studies have shown um, it does reduce, reduce your risk of heart disease by 25 to 28% and can reduce your risk of stroke by 30 to 36%. So pretty good health benefits there. Fiber can also help with our blood sugar control. It does this by helping to slow down digestion so that the glucose in our bloodstream is absorbed a little bit more slowly, which helps to prevent um, this glucose surge and rebound or these peaks and valleys. And again, rather gives us these rolling hills um, of our blood sugar instead of, again, peaks and valleys. So it helps the slow digestion, um, helps to keep that, that blood sugar at a more even, even keel, um, and can also help with weight maintenance. So this uh, fiber works in a few different ways as far as weight maintenance goes. Typically, those high fiber foods, so think, again, whole grains, fruits, veggies, beans and legumes. Those foods are typically low in solid fats and added sugars. They've got all kinds of nutrients for us, but they are lower in fat and lower in sugar, uh, which we know is better for our overall health, um, which can help with weight maintenance. Um, it also helps to keep you feeling fuller longer. Um, and of course, if you are not hungry, you're, you're going to be eating less, which can help with that, that weight maintenance piece. Um, I always like to think about this too. If you were going to choose, um, say, a piece of white bread versus um, a half a cup of oatmeal, both grains, both are going to serve our bodies, right? But one of those is probably going to help you to stay fuller longer. And it's that whole grain one. So, right, if you're feeling fuller longer, you're less likely to maybe snack on those um, extra or added calorie food items mid-morning. Mid Now, I did want to talk about the flip side. Um, if we're not getting enough fiber in our diets, what that can mean for us, and unfortunately, that does meet, have um, some potentially unfavorable outcomes. The couple that really kind of rose to the top when Mary and I were talking about this were diverticulosis and diverticulitis. You might be like, what is that? Okay, so I wanted to explain a little bit what it is. So diverticulosis is this condition where these really small pouches called diverticula develop in your lower intestines. And it is a very, very common dis, um, disorder of the colon in, in the Western world. Um, and essentially what happens is when your stool is in your system for a longer time. It doesn't have that fiber to kind of help move things through. There can be that additional pressure in your intestines. And that's where you can end up getting like these little pockets or bubbles. Um, sometimes you, a person might not even know that they have diverticulosis, but the older we get, that, that chance increases. And again, if we're not getting enough fiber. Oftentimes, diverticulosis is first noticed um, when those pouches tear or become inflamed, which leads to this diverticulitis. That's when those little pouches are getting angry and red and uncomfortable. And when you have diverticulitis, this can really cause a lot of um, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, fever. Um, and typically, a treatment requires a brief period of time where there's no food, you're drinking liquids only, and you are on antibiotics. Um, so it's not a whole lot of fun. But again, if we're getting enough of our daily fiber, we can help to reduce our risk of developing these things. 
And of course, um, as mentioned in a couple of our previous slides, it also does help to um, decrease, or we don't get enough fiber, our risk for developing type 2 diabetes as well as heart disease does increase. So it's important to get that recommended amount of fiber daily. I did want to mention just very, very briefly, there are some special circumstances or, or situations where eating a diet high in fiber is not recommended. Um, I, I want to point that out that if that's the case, you should be working with your primary care provider. They would be the one informing you of this or, or your health care provider um, that you would need to have a low fiber diet. But some of those situations where you would not eat a lot of fiber or try to shy away from extra, extra fiber would be if you had some sort of tumor in your um, intestinal tract. Certain inflammatory diseases, as I mentioned with the diverticulitis, might be a, a brief period of time where you would need to be on a low fiber diet. Um, if you are going through radiation treatments um, or cancer treatments, at times you might have to have a low fiber diet. And again, um, just before surgery, oftentimes you might be encouraged to have a low fiber diet. Just depends on, and again, this isn't something you would want to self-diagnose. You would want to be working with a healthcare provider to assist with this and to uh, not diagnose it. Why can't I think of the word, Mary? Prescribe it. There we go. That's what I was thinking. Prescribe it. Good. Um, so thanks, Nikki, for sharing all those um, interesting facts about those health benefits about fiber. So if everyone just wants to take a moment and what are, what did you find interesting about or surprising about fiber as she kind of went through some of those different benefits of having a fiber fiber in your diet? So feel free to put those in chat. So um, lower risk of heart, um, stroke is coming in. How fiber lowers cholesterol. Yeah, thanks for that really good explanation, Nikki. I think a lot of times we hear about it, but it's always nice to know how it actually works. That's always very helpful. Um, and then how it lowers um, the risk of stroke with that. It looks like the bile and the cholesterol is definitely a fun fact that a lot of people learned, the cholesterol, great. The link to heart health. Um, didn't realize beans have different grams of fiber. So yep, always good to read those labels and see how much fiber is in different foods. So, so we're gonna go on to our next fact or myth question. So fact or myth, the more fiber you eat, the better. Fact or myth. So feel free to put that in your chat, in the chat. Okay, myth, myth. We do have a really great group here. They seem to be getting 100% on all our questions. We're going to have to have a stumper question in one of the, the last sessions. I was last just thinking sessions. that. I was thinking, <laughs> so. I'm going to have to really up my game and challenge these folks. <laughs> oh, so everyone's correct. Um, it is a myth that too much fiber is not a good thing. Just like anything, um, too much of anything is not good, and it can cause a variety of different problems. So we're going to talk about some of those different things. So um, one of the things that can happen is it can cause too much gas or even diarrhea. Um, you get that fermentation happening and we've all had that experience where you just feel gassy and bloated. Um, so if you all of a sudden decide I'm going to eat lots and lots and lots and lots of fiber, that's definitely a side effect you can get that can actually be kind of painful if you get um, really bad gas and it, it does take a while to relieve that. So again, that's a problem with that excess fiber. I mean, if you remember, Nikki talked about one of the benefits of fiber is that it helps move everything through your digestive system a little bit quicker. Um, so if you think if you have a lot of fiber, it's going to be moving through even more quickly. Um, so then you're not going to have time in the intestine for all those nutrients to get a um, absorbed. So again, too much it's going to get through. You're not going to absorb the energy and the nutrients that are in your food. Um, she also talked about how that can kind of slow down um, some of the make you feel full longer. Um, so if you are eating too much fiber, you might just find that you're not hungry enough. And then you're not going to get the en energy and the nutrients you need because you're just not going to be eating enough. Um, and that's especially true with some of the elderly and young children. Um, but you'd have to have about 40 grams a day to really run into that problem. So again, it's significantly a lot more than what we're currently getting. But um, some people really go gung-ho sometimes and they decide I'm just going to go and really increase as much as I can. And again, that is not necessarily a good thing. 
Um, so hopefully you're all inspired to go and try and increase your fiber a little bit. Um, but it's important to remember to start slowly when you're going to add fiber. Again, you don't want to experience a lot of that gas and bloating feeling. Um, and actually, sometimes if you add too much with not enough water, it can actually cause constipation. So um, it's important to remember to go slow and add no more than this should actually be five grams of fiber per day per week. Um, so you can definitely add more than five grams per week. Um, it's per day per week. Um, so again, adding an extra fruit or vegetable is going to be fine. But if you just decide I'm just going to go gung-ho and have you know a bran cereal for breakfast and um, uh, bean soup for lunch and then something else really high fiber for the evening meal you're probably going to feel that in your gut a little bit so again making sure that you just maybe do one or two foods a day and then over the course of a week you'll be fine um, and again making sure you drink lots of fluids with that because it absorbs um, the different water into your intestines but if you don't have enough water there's not going to be the water for it to absorb and then you're going to end up with constipation that doesn't happen too often but again, you want to prevent that if possible. So making sure you're drinking lots of fluids along with gradually increasing the fiber. Okay, so you may be wondering about fiber supplements because that's something that you do hear about. Um, and the research has shown that daily use of the fiber supplements isn't harmful. Um, but we always talk about it still is better to get it from your food because in addition to the fiber, you're also getting um, different vitamins and minerals and these phytonutrients. So there's just so much more to it than just the fiber itself. So first try and get it from foods. If you really can't get enough from foods, then you can try a fiber supplement. Um, if you are taking any medica medications, however, make sure you talk to your pharmacist, your healthcare provider, just to find out if those fiber supplements would have any interaction with the medications that you are taking. Okay. Um, here's kind of just a little fun fact I always find interesting about fiber supplements, um, especially if you're going to maybe get like a fiber bar or something else that is maybe a food that's been supplemented with extra fiber, um, is that oftentimes you will see inulin as the fiber that is used, and that actually comes from a plant called chicory root. And many years ago when I was working in Extension in Redwood County, we had an event, um, it was called Farm Fest, and they always had different things that they were experimenting and um, just trying different trials for farmers to come and look at and one year they planted chicory root and um, that was what it was kind of for to see well how does this grow in Minnesota for um, it to be used in, as inulin. I never found out exactly how it went. I don't think it went too well because I don't hear of many people in Minnesota growing chicory root um, to be used as inulin but um, just kind of something fun if you happen to see something that has been supplemented with fiber um, check and see if it does come from the inulin source. Okay, um, so if we do want to try and get as much as fiber as we can from foods versus supplements, here are some simple tips that you can use to make sure that you kind of start to add that fiber to your diet. Um, one thing is to start your day off right. And I'm going to kind of give you a couple comparisons here of instead of this, do that. And at the end, I'm going to tell you how much we increase the fiber by. Okay, um, so if you typically have orange juice and maybe like a rice puff cereal for breakfast, you can switch that off to instead of the juice having an orange and then go for a higher um, brand cereal like a raisin bran. Okay, that could be one fairly simple switch that you could make. Um, another thing you can do is switch to whole grain foods. So instead of having white bread, you could have whole wheat bread. Um, this one is something you might not think of, but bulk up on your baked goods. So people do like baked goods and they're, they're fine. You just want to include them in a variety and moderation. But let's say you have um, a cinnamon muffin for a snack and um, a better way to bulk it up would maybe be to have a banana muffin and to bulk it up even more, add some raisins in it. That's a great way to really make sure you're getting a little bit more fiber in there. Um, and also adding those legumes. If you just have a plain um, like chicken noodle soup, you're not going to get a lot of fiber, but if you switch it to a bean soup, you're going to get added fiber. Maybe you don't want to go to 100% bean soup if you're kind of new to beans and you're like, don't like them that well, and maybe you really, really like your chicken noodle soup. Well, just take your chicken noodle soup and then add maybe half a cup of beans to it to start with and kind of just add it that way. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. That's the important thing to remember. Um, and eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, again, just in general, we talked about the little kids not getting enough fruit and fruits and vegetables. Um, adults are kind of the same or maybe a little bit better sometimes with our um, veggies, but not getting enough of those fruits compared to kids. Let me clarify that because kids are really usually pretty very good about getting their fruit and not so good about the vegetables. And adults, we are a little bit better about getting the vegetables than um, 
and we also do good on the fruits, but we still need to eat more of those um, different foods. Um, so again, if you go from having just maybe like chips for a snack to fruits and vegetables, that kind of ties in with that last one of really making sure you make your um, snacks count and trying to get a fruit or vegetable in as of those snacks, okay? So if we were to kind of do that first menu for the day of just like the orange juice, the rice puff cereal, the white bread, um, kind of just maybe like a cracker for a snack, that works out to be about four grams of fiber. If you do the substitutions that we talked about, like having an orange and maybe raisin bran and whole wheat bread, that actually got us up to 33 grams of fiber. So you could see it can really add up quickly and things that are really not that hard to do and really add a lot of flavor and variety to your diet. So those are good things to definitely try. Sorry, I was adding in the chat here, Mary. I was I lost total track of my the question that I was going to ask. Um, but our our next question here is just kind of thinking about knowing what Mary talked about, all of the different food um, food options there are that are high in fiber. Some of those substitutions that could be made. Um, how do you plan to increase your fiber intake? Again, assuming um, that you're not getting enough. Like the like the average American, <laughs> like myself, even some days. Let's see overnight oats with chia seeds. Oh yeah, love love a good overnight oat. Okay, some some supplements. Having fruit for snacks. Yeah, adding in those fruits and veggies for snacks. And, you know, just an added bonus to doing those types of things, not only are they high in fiber, but again, they're going to be really high in other vitamins and minerals as well. Changing up the cold cereal, just adding some beans to a soup. Yeah, it doesn't have to be just a bean soup. <laughs> we can have other things in there. Oh, Jennifer thinks she's got it. She's eaten a lot of fiber already. Love it. Good for you. Making sure you're including a salad in my meals for the week. Great. I see we have just another question about how much fiber a person does need. Again, we have some general guidelines for how much fiber a person needs, but it's definitely going to depend on your calorie needs, <clears throat> your activity level, that type of thing. Generally, however, for women, it's recommended 21 to 25 grams of fiber per day. And for men, it is 30 to 38 grams per day. Oh, making their own breakfast cookies again with all the food. I'm going to change up my questions for next time. <laughs> Thank you. Someone earlier on, just before you put the question on, had a question about oh. um, the best high, how to best or a breakfast cereal they would recommend oh. that's high in fiber and I was just going to say it really depends upon what your tastes and preferences are so I'd encourage you really just look at that label and compare um, different cereals as you're going down the cereal aisle because there's no one really best one it's really whatever you like the taste of and then again that nutrition facts labels just makes it so much easier to compare the different cereals absolutely and I, I think I'm, I replied back to that one that there are a lot of options. Like check it out, check it out. There's a, a bunch of different cold cereal options. Um, I personally, I think breakfast is a really nice way to maybe sneak in a little bit of extra fiber um, because there are so many fantastic options um, for like your traditional breakfast, breakfast foods, if you will. I see we've got a couple more questions in the chat. We'll, we'll get to those in, in just a moment. We're we're nearly to the end of our time here. Um, whoa, and then I started to go through too fast. <laughs> um, but we did just wanna kind of summarize. So fiber, as I mentioned, I still love it. I think it's a great thing to talk about. We, we don't typically get enough of it, but we definitely have those opportunities for improvement. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about your, your fiber, where you're gonna get it, Again, variety of sources is going to be great because we do want to mix it up between that soluble and insoluble fiber. They both provide um, a different type of fiber. They do both have different jobs within the digestional tract and are going to provide different health benefits for us. So again, get a good mix of those different fiber foods. Um, fiber does provide us with a lot of health benefits. 
not only is it good for your digestive tract, um, your gut health, but also that heart health, reducing your risk for chronic diseases such as um, heart disease, diabetes, stroke. <clears throat> so increasing that fiber and of course, the health benefit of weight maintenance. That's always a bonus as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as you're thinking about increasing that fiber, like this is that like that bright red warning sign I always think of. You want to do it slowly. As Mary mentioned, no more than an additional five grams of fiber per day. Do that for an entire week just so that you don't overload your system. We don't want you to be uncomfortable and be cursing Mary and I, you know, at the end of the week when you've got an upset stomach. Um, instead, <laughs> increase it slowly. You know, take what wherever you're at right now and just add again up to up to five grams a day for a week and then increase from there. And from that, that is that is our presentation for today. We're even a little bit ahead of schedule. But I did want to mention um, that if you are looking for a certificate of participation or you are looking for those well-being points, what you're going to need to do is follow the link that I just added to the chat here. It is z.umn.edu backslash dinner eval. You're going to want to select the What's for Dinner series as well as mark the little checkbox on the survey um, indicating that you do want a certificate of participation and those well-being points. So again, well-being points, participant um, certificate of participation, make sure you utilize this, this survey. I will send it in our follow-up email um, either later today or even tomorrow. I did also want to mention that this will be recorded. So if you had questions and you wanted to look back on it later, that will be provided to you as well. Or if you're interested in any of our other webinars, we have a phenomenal set of series that are going to be happening over the next couple of months. Um, take a look at them here. Anything health and nutrition related, related is typically in our What's for Dinner series. And of course, we always want you to engage with us. So um, if you're interested in learning alongside us um, via social media, we definitely have those options for you as well. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm hoping, I think, Mary, we have just a couple moments. Are there any questions that we can go back to in the chat to, to maybe wrap up? Yeah, there was one that um, I put the answer in just before you put the evaluant evaluation in. So I just wanted to share that one. Um, someone asked about cooking and how that impacts the fiber content. And um, it doesn't have a significant impact on the fiber, but it's important to remember, especially if you start overcooking things that can de degrade a lot of different things, especially the vitamins and minerals. So the fiber is going to stay pretty much the same, but you're going to lose more vitamins and minerals, especially if you start to overcook it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Is there any truth to considering the order in which you eat your foods with fiber to gain more nutrition or to have digestion without gas? I'm going to say no, but I, I, I'm not, don't quote me on this. Um, we can do further digging into it, but I think that's probably, probably going to have to do more with the load of fiber. Um, if you're having a really large quantity in a particular meal, or perhaps you, you're, ate a lot more fiber that day than you typically do. Um, and that's where that that uncomfortable gas can maybe come, um, come into play. But I don't know about the order of things. I will double check on that and we can get back to you. Unless Mary, you know a definitive answer. I would say the same thing that you said. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I do not have, I've never seen anything that says eat so much at a certain time or anything like that. So I, I agree, just kind of spread it out throughout the day. And I've never seen anything in terms of timing with different um, food groups either. So, okay. And that might actually play into, I see we have another question about trying to spread out your fiber throughout the day. I definitely think that would be a recommendation rather than trying to get all of your fiber in that one meal. Again, as Mary mentioned, fiber does or can make you feel very full. <clears throat> um, and sometimes that can affect your, your food choices throughout the day. 
I also would say that can overload your system. Um, just like with all of our nutrients, it's best to kind of spread them out throughout the day rather than trying to get everything in all in one shot. Um, you'll be more comfortable that way and your body is going to be able to better utilize and digest um, all that it needs to. Great I questions. See I see there's a question on the different type of oatmeals, and I get as excited about the different kind of oatmeals as Nikki does about explaining fiber. So <laughs> I'll be happy to answer the question about the different kind of oats. So um, if you're looking at steel cut oats and your rolled oats, those are actually the same nutrition wise and fiber wise. It's just that in rolled oats, they get rolled between rollers, so they're really flat, and steel cut oats, they go between blades and they're cut. And um, the rolled fat ones, because there's more surface area and they're very, like, very thin, they cook up much quicker. Whereas the steel cut oats, they are bigger pieces. So they take significantly longer to cook. So I've seen some brands will take like 45 minutes. So those take longer. And some people like the crunch of the steel cut oats a little bit more than the rolled oats. Okay. Um, so within our rolled oats, we also have old fashioned oats and then the quick co cooking oats. So the old fashioned oats are just rolled, whereas the quick cooking ones that cook in about a minute, minute and a half, those are um, rolled, but then they're also chopped into smaller pieces. Okay. So those are all pretty much about the same, or they are the same, okay? It gets a little bit different when we get into our instant oatmeals, because those are rolled, and they're cut very, very thin and into very small pieces, and then they're actually pre-cooked, so and then dehydrated, so then um, they cook up much quicker, and you can just actually add hot water to them, and they'll cook, whereas like with the quick oats, you have to actually bring it to um, a boil. Uh, so the challenge with the instant oats it's nice because they're very quick and easy to use but they're processed more um so typically they have added salt to it um so if you're really trying to limit your salt intake um you want to just stick to your rolled and your um, steel cut oats and especially when you start to get your different flavored oatmeals like maybe your peaches and cream your maple syrup flavored that's when there's a lot of added sugar to it so if you're trying to limit your sugar intake um again you're better off going with like a rolled or a steel cut oat and add your own sugar to it it's still going to be less sugar than if well, I shouldn't say it's still assuming you don't put a lot and lot of sugar on your oatmeal if you just sprinkle some on it's going to be less sugar than if you have bought instant oats All see there's right. a Oh, I was going to say there's a question about fiber in white rice. Oh. Um, I think it's very limited in white rice. There's probably some in there, but definitely much more in um, brown rice. I don't know what the actual difference is cup per cup, though. Great questions, everybody. And thank you once again for joining us today. We hope you all have a fantastic afternoon.